Population health flips the usual model of U.S. healthcare on its head. Instead of waiting for patients to get sick and then billing on a fee-for-service basis when they seek care, population health is proactive. <laughs> it addresses the root causes of disease in the community by focusing on prevention and the social determinants of health. It sounds great in theory, but is anyone actually making it work? Welcome to Care Talk Executive Features, a series where we spotlight innovative organizations and leaders working to advance the healthcare field. I'm your host, David Williams, president of Health Business Group, and my guest today is Mark Clement, CEO of TriHealth, which puts population health principles into practice. Mark, welcome to Care Talk. Well, thank you, David. It's uh, it's great to be with you today. Outstanding. Well, I want to hear a little bit about your background and your role at TriHealth. Well, terrific, Dave. And again, once once again, uh, th- thank you for uh, give, giving me the opportunity to participate in this uh, this podcast and and tell uh, Tri Health story. So, um, again, my name is Mark Clement. I've uh, had the great privilege of being a part of this organization for nine years. Actually, this month I'll start my tenth year as president and chief executive officer of Tri Health. Um, my story is a, a little bit unique, at least unique for you know uh, folks that do what I do. Um, I uh, actually grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, I was born in one of Trihell's hospitals. Uh, my father was a practicing primary care physician uh, who uh, you know, uh, completed his medical school training at University of Cincinnati and then went on to complete his residency at one of our hospitals. Uh, my older brother, also a primary care physician, practiced at one of our hospitals. I never dreamed uh, that I'd come back to my hometown, Cincinnati, uh, having spent most of my career in uh, Chicago, Boston, and upstate New York, uh, but uh, had the opportunity to return to Cincinnati now uh, a little more than nine years ago. And um, it really has been um, you know, uh, the, the privilege of my career to come, come back to my hometown and be involved in such important work that is underway at TriHealth. And that, that work is really about transforming how we deliver care, as you refer uh, to, pop, uh, to using population health uh, financing and care models. Well, Mark, you know, you have an impressive redume, resume and then with your pedigree of being born at the hospital and, and all the connections, I would hate to have been the other guy that, you know, who was up against you for uh, uh, for the role. So uh, well done of really locking it in. Uh, thank you, David. So, you know, Cincinnati, I haven't spent too much time there. What I, one of the things I remember about is when they were they were promoting Cincinnati as like a great hub an airline hub. I remember somebody, it was maybe Delta or somebody that had like said Cincinnati instead, like to go there rather than somewhere else. It has a, you know, it has like a nice aura around it, but, but tell me a little bit about like greater Cincinnati and what the TriHealth vision is for it. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, greater Cincinnati, it's, uh, it's located in Southwest Ohio. We serve what we call the tri-state area, uh, s- Southeast Indiana and Northern Kentucky, along with Southwest Cincinnati. Um, population approaching 2 million uh, residents. Um, I like to say, having you know lived in Chicago, raised my kids in Chicago and Boston, uh, Cincinnati, uh, it, uh, and those are two obviously world-class cities. Uh, Cincinnati really offers pretty much everything that those world-class cities uh, offer, but uh, everything is so much easier. Uh, traffic is easier. It's easier to get around town. And um, you know we're blessed with um, with you know a really really good healthcare system, and, and it, we like to think that Tri Health is kind of leading the way with uh, the healthcare system uh, here in Cincinnati, and hopefully we'll get into into that in just a minute. No, that sound that sounds great. I remember we've done some work uh, in Ohio, some of your other cities like uh, Cleveland, and they have very different characteristics. And I think yeah. you know Cincinnati's got a well organized uh, employer group. Um, among other things, and I think with P and G having been uh, headquartered there, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it has a, it has a real kind of a, a civic identity uh, to it that maybe punches above its weight. You know, it it really does, David. Uh, actually, I met with an employer, uh, an employer group, or the employer group. Uh, there may be multiple, but I, I just just last week to talk about. Uh, you know, the imperatives around healthcare transformation. Uh, and you're right, Cincinnati is blessed with having a number of Fortune, you know, 500, uh, you know, co- companies based corporately here in Cincinnati, whether that's Fifth Third Bank or Kroger's or, or GE uh, Aviation, uh, all based here in Cincinnati, among others. Uh, good. But let me ask you the hard, what was going to be the hard question, but is more, I think, up your alley is, I mean, what is population health? 
Well, um, you know, I think most, you know, most experts would agree that, you know, um, you know, uh, our, our current uh, healthcare delivery system, uh, which is based upon a, a fee-for-service uh, financing mechanism or fee-for-service payment models, um, is uh, is broken in many ways. Uh, you know, uh, uh, human beings, as we all know, a- operate in their own economic self-interest, and when you create, uh, you know, uh, financing systems or payment models that incentivize volume, you're going to get more volume, and uh, you know, uh, uh, and and that you know that is. Historically, how we have uh, reimbursed or financed uh, healthcare in our country, it's on a fee for service payment uh, basis. And so, um, you know, the incentives around a fee for service payment system are to encourage, you know, more volume because that generates more revenue, uh, which Im- improve- improves the economic prosperity of the organization. It also, I think, unintentionally, and, and these are unintended consequences, unintentionally promotes fragmented, episodic, reactive care. So when we think about population uh, health, um, you know, I think most ec- experts would agree that it is a, it's a, a fundamentally different approach to how we both finance and deliver care. Uh, it's, uh, you know, l- less reactive and more proactive. It's less a sick care system and more a health care system by evolving the underlying um, incentives uh, that are that uh, reward health systems and providers like TriHealth uh, for um, the right things. And the right things are prevention, early detection, better management of chronic disease, ultimately to deliver on what Do- Dr. Donald Berwick, who founded the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, coined the triple aim. And then he went on to uh, expand yeah. that to the triple aim plus the tr- triple aim is better care, better health, better value, and uh, an enhanced practice and work environment for physicians and team members. Can we talk about a little bit about sort of what's wrong with fee for service to begin with? Because I definitely uh, hear you, and and this is um, you know makes tremendous sense about getting paid to keep people healthy and and so on and so forth. But but in other parts of the economy. It doesn't seem to be such a problem to pay people for what they're doing. So I, I'll just give an example. So, you know, if I have my car and I take it to the gas station, you know, I, I pay them for however many gallons of fuel they put in my tank. And uh, yeah, I probably, you know, maybe I should get my oil changed more frequently or, you know, keep the tires at the right pressure and, and all that kind of thing. But but for some reason, it seems to work out okay. I go and I, I, I get the maintenance more or less when it's recommended. I, I fill the car up and we're all happy. But somehow in healthcare, it's not okay to pay doctors for what they're doing. They're just, you know, somebody came to their office, they they treated them, they should be paid. So wh- why does that mess us up so badly? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I don't think fee for service is ever entirely, at least in my career and as far out as I can see, I don't think it's it, fee for service is, is going to go away. Uh, but, but what we are seeing increasingly is that um, value-based incentives uh, are being uh, placed on top of fee-for-service uh, to, 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 to cr- create uh, incentives to, uh, to, um, to, to, to deliver on uh, the triple aim. So back to your, your analogy, I go, you know, I take my car and I need the, the, you know, the wheels uh, changed. You know, what's wrong with, uh, you know, competing on price relative to tires? Yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, in, in some cases in healthcare, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but the aim isn't, you know, to just change tires or to, uh, you know, st- stitch up a laceration. The aim is to improve the overall health of individuals and populations. And um, if uh, we've got a payment of system that only rewards uh, you know, care that's provided uh, in response to, to disease and illness, then, you know, act, acting is a, is a, is a, is a, a you know, uh, in, a, in an economically rational way. Um, why, why would, I'm, I'm going to be a little provocative here, why would a health system want to keep people healthy if they're only getting paid when they're sick, not to keep, when they're not getting paid to keep people healthy? Uh, and, and they're only getting reimbursed when, when um, folks are sick or injured or ill and show up in their emergency departments or in their physician offices. Population health is really about rethinking those, those underlying incentives and a, a realigning um, beha- the behavior of healthcare providers, physicians, health systems like ours uh, to both you know, cure and, and respond to disease and illness. But as well, um, proactively work to, uh, to detect disease earlier, to prevent disease in the first place, 
to provide care in the, in the least costly uh, part of our integrated health system, and ultimately to um, improve health and uh, drive down costs. We know um, that uh, our system of healthcare in the United States uh, is the most costly healthcare system in the world. Uh, we pay more, we spend more for health care uh, in our country than any other nation in the world, approaching 20 percent of our gross domestic product. And yet we know that uh, that our outcomes, um, you know, lag many, many, many countries around the world, whether it's Canada, just across the border to the north, uh, Great Britain, France, most European countries. Our life expectancy is below Canadians. Uh, life expectancy. Uh, it's below most of Europe's life expectancy. Infant mortality is higher in our nation than in most Western co countries. Access to health care uh, is more limited in, in our nation uh, than, than other nations around the country and, and or around the world. And yet we spend more than any other in the world. And I would argue that a big part of that is uh, the perverse incentives uh, that are, are un unintended, but nonetheless exist. In a, um, in a transactional financing system that doesn't hold providers accountable and that doesn't really reward the right things or yeah, all of the right things. We were involved in uh, some population health level efforts in, uh, in Detroit some years ago. And you know one of the approaches was to try to reduce the number of unnecessary emergency room visits. Mm -hmm. Problem was the hospitals in Detroit, if they weren't getting those emergency room visits, they're, they're gonna go out of business. So it wasn't That's even exactly that they didn't right. wanna keep somebody healthy. It's just like, they're gonna be gone. They don't have That's people right. coming in. So someone's got to do, take policy at a different level for that That's to be right. able to work. Yeah. So TriHealth, let's talk about TriHealth. And what is TriHealth's approach to population health? Well, it's been a very intentional. It's been very deliberate. Uh, and, it, and it goes back in many ways to the, to the creation and the, and the founding of TriHealth now more than 25 years ago. TriHealth is the product of a, of a partnership, a merger between uh, two um, tertiary care hospitals that came together, uh, Good Samaritan Hospital and Bethesda, uh, Bethesda Oak, uh, which had a satellite hospital called Bethesda North. Those, uh, uh, those two organizations came together. They were independent uh, uh, hospitals um, operating independently. They came together in the mid-90s to create TriHealth. And um, TriHealth has has grown rapidly since, but their their vision and and, and um, I've, I've been in healthcare long enough to remember you know risk based contracting yeah. and, and capitation in the '90s and and that's when TriHealth was founded, and it was really the first foray into into population. What I would argue was the first foray into into population health, really modeling payment uh, arrangements after what, around what we've seen in Kaiser, which has been a kind of an HMO model for, for you know, nearly 100 years. And, and the vision of TriHealth then and uh, continuing into to, to, to today um, was to really um, transform the way in which care uh, is delivered uh, for the better. And uh, so um, uh, in, in the ensuing you know, years, uh, TriHealth uh, expanded from a, a two hospital system to a six hospital system. And when I arrived in Cincinnati, uh, and, and as you know, um, uh, you know, in the uh, early 2000s, um, because of, I think, a lack of, of big data and ability to really successfully manage care, uh, there was a kind of a, um, a reaction to in a, in a um, rejection of uh, risk-based uh, uh, HMO closed panel uh, yeah. or, um, health plans, and um, because many in many ways, um, you know, managed care in the '90s was was um, was um, uh, you know uh, provided through what were called gatekeepers, and it was pre preventing care more than it was managing care. It was it was you know serving as a as a uh, as a gatekeeper to care, and it didn't really work very well. Um, may have saved some costs, but it did. It, it, Created all kinds of access issues. Uh, fast forward, uh, you know, to 2015, I arrived uh, here in Cincinnati, and um, our board and our management team and physician leaders um, went through, as you would typically do with with new leadership team, uh, a, a planning process, and we returned to our roots and our original original vision of transforming healthcare for the better. Um, and at that point. Uh, we uh, were a burgeoning integrated delivering delivery system, more than just six hospitals, uh, you know, a, a, a nascent uh, ambulatory network, uh, a large employed physician group, uh, post-acute capabilities like hospice and palliative care. 
And uh, so we made the decision, um, rather than doubling down on what we knew was a, a broken uh, healthcare delivery system in our country, financed through fee for service, um, we recognize that things are very different today than 170 years ago when our when our uh, oldest flagship yeah. hospital, Good Samaritan Hospital, was founded, and the way we carried our mission out 170 years ago, and that mission was to improve the health of our community. It was through, you know, uh, reacting and, and curing illness and disease because that's all we really knew. Well, a lot of advances have occurred in that that's that 170 years, you know, ranging from technology. Uh, to medical practice, uh, to uh, advances in, in the genome, uh, as well as big data. Uh, and, and, and that big data now allows us to understand the health of our nearly 600,000 uh, patients that we care for. So we made the decision to really transform and lead the way locally and really emerge as a model nationally for transforming healthcare for the better. And I'd, I'd love to tell you a little bit about how we do that. No, that, so that sounds terrific. You know, population health has become um, a popular term. And actually, sometimes you go to a conference like HIMSS, you might see it all over the place. And of course, that's naturally led to some, you know, misunderstandings. And are, are there particular things that you would say that people misunderstand about population health? Yeah, I, I, I uh, probably a, a several. Uh, one is it's, 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 um, it's, it's not an initiative uh, and it's not just a change in, um, you know, your contracting. Yeah. Uh, it is a fundamental change in, in your, uh, for want of a better word, your business model, uh, your care models, uh, your financing system, the culture of your organization, um, uh, the, the culture of your physician community. It is a fundamental change in, in how you do everything that you do. And so when we embarked upon this journey, and I guess maybe the other uh, misconception is that um, if you, because there's been a a, a lot of high profile examples of this. If you embrace population health, you, you, uh, you imperil your organization financially. Yeah, right. uh, many organizations have gone down this path and have been unsuccessful financially and have reversed courses. Uh, and I can tell you that, uh, that that's not uh, necessarily the case if you approach it act correctly as we believe we have. We've never been um, stronger financially than we are today, even at a time when our industry is experiencing very significant financial challenges. I think we may be the only health system in greater Cincinnati that's continuing to operate profitably, uh, that hasn't been downgraded uh, yeah. you know, by, by its, uh, you know, the, cre the, uh, the credit rating agencies. Um, you know, we're going to achieve a, a 3% plus operating margin this nice. year. Um, and we're growing uh, market share. Um, we're the, you know, the, uh, the leading uh, healthcare provider in this market uh, on, on, man, on many fronts. So, and, 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 and at the same time, um, you know, more than 50% of our patients, uh, or roughly 50% of our patients, nearly 300,000 of the 600,000 members of the community that we regularly care for in our primary care practices and in our service lines. Um, uh, nearly 300,000 are in some form of value-based payment arrangement. And we can talk more about those in, in just a moment. Great. But the way, the way that we've, if we'll go ahead, I'll, I'll pause here. No, David. I was going to say, I, I do want to talk about your, uh, some of your initiatives, but I wanted to mention that this concept of population health and the related topic of social determinants of health has really gone, you know, even beyond the, you know, the Don Berwicks and other healthcare thinkers right yeah. up to the White House. And in That's fact, right. the, the White House, if I'm not mistaken, this year actually released a playbook to address social determinants of health. And I wonder how does that, something that's right, how does that kind of contribute overall to population health, to, you know, this, this notion of, of population health, social determinants, population health, White House involvement, yeah. what does that do? Yeah, 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 and you're you're right about that. The, you know, the uh, the, the White House uh, has re re uh, released a, a playbook, but it's more than just the White House releasing a playbook on social determinants of health, which is I think maybe a bit of a wake up call for our industry. It's not yeah. a wake up call for us. It's something that we've been dealing with since the very you know outset of our journey around population health. We know that social determinants of health, and this is uh, uh, as well. Um, reflected in the, in the in the playbook from you know, from the White House, uh, social determinants of, of health, whether that's food insecurity or housing insecurity or lack of transportation uh, or uh, wealth inequity, socioeconomic uh, 
uh, disparities uh, uh, that contribute directly to health outcomes and to uh, health inequity. Um, you know, for example, for, for example, uh, we know that food secu secure insecurity alone uh, is responsible for as much as a 15 percent increase in chronic disease uh, and 100 percent increase uh, it contributes uh, has contributed to a significant increase in uh, mental uh, health issues for new moms and uh, infants uh, and, a, and as much as a 58 percent increase in the risk of death. And, and the list goes on and on and on about these these. Uh, health disparities. I can tell you here in Cincinnati, um, the distance uh, in uh, uh, a, a six mile distance in two neighborhoods, um, Mount Adams, which is literally, you know, a, a half a mile from where I'm speaking to you from uh, versus uh, lower price Hill uh, on the west side of Cincinnati. Life expectancy uh, differs by 26 years uh, from you know, roughly 60 years life expectancy in lower price, price hill uh, to, you know, 85, 86 years yeah. life expectancy. And, and those are health disparities. And, and, and those, you know, really troubling outcomes are the result of um, food insecurity, housing insecurity, socioeconomic differences. And so uh, we've, we've uh, developed a playbook of our own uh, to, to really address those because we know we will never be successful in improving the health of our community unless we are helping patients to get to their their physician office visit uh, or to get to, you know, to one of our hospitals for a procedure. Uh, we know that, uh, that moms uh, and families will not raise healthy kids uh, if they don't have food. So we, we've created eight free food banks. Um, we provide thousands of free rides to our patients every month, every month. That's not year, every month. Yeah. But I would say even beyond the White House um, playbook on disparities, um, CMS uh, has developed innovative uh, um, financing, um, alternative financing um, models for the Medicare population. Mm -hmm. And we, we, uh, one of those is um, an affordable, uh, not affordable care, but it, it, it all started with the Affordable Care Act, right. but it's an accountable care organization. It's called ACO REACH, Accountable Care Organization REACH which uh, really focuses on and rewards health systems like TriHealth for addressing um, uh, social determinants of health and, and health disparities. We have about uh, 25,000 um, traditional fee-for-service Medicare patients that are in ACO reach. Uh, we have probably another 50,000 uh, Medicare Advantage uh, 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 patients that we care for through value-based payment arrangements. Pretty much every Medicare patient we care for is in a value-based payment arrangement. And uh, we get rewarded for addressing, economically rewarded for addressing those social determinants of health. Yeah, Mark, I had been doing a little research uh, in preparation for this interview, and you you just made it even starker than I had understood about the disparities between you know two nearby neighborhoods. And I, I know you see it, you see it some in Boston, you see it in New York City. You know, one yeah. zip code compared to another. You had mentioned earlier about you know how the U.S. health system doesn't perform, and you're comparing life expectancy here with you know Canada or Europe. But what you're seeing within your own community, that's right, is you've got like basically not to say anything negative, but you've got like Guatemala level, that's right. Public health on the one place, and you've got Japan level, or you know, richest part of Singapore level right. on the other. So that's that. May, I don't know. If that's unique to the U.S., but you know, how do you how do you address that? Because it's not it's not the same kind of initiative you would do in that eighty six, uh, you know, life expectancy neighborhood compared to one that's at sixty. Yeah, I, I think you put your finger on um, you know uh, an, an, impor an important factor here. Um, which is driving a lot of these health outcomes. If you look at every other one of those uh, those those uh, those nations that we've used as a kind of a reference point, whether it's Europe or Canada or Japan, what's the big difference between those countries and the U.S.? The yeah. big difference is universal health access. Right. Um, you know, we've we still have, and and we've made I think uh, encouraging progress with the Affordable Care Act to. to to close that gap, but we still have 30 to 40 million Americans that don't have the same access to health care that you and I have because, you know, we receive, you know, employer sponsored health benefits or we receive Medicaid or we receive, receive Medicare. There's still a, a gap in, a, you know, in a very significant gap of millions of Americans that don't qualify and they fall through the, the, the cracks and uh, they, 
And that's a major contributor. Uh, and that's a, that's, you know, that, that's uh, in, in my opinion, that's a real failing in terms of health policy within our country. Um, so we do what we can do. And, um, you know, Tri Health is a, uh, is a, is a, is a not for profit organization. We care for every patient in need, irrespective of their ability to pay, whether they have insurance or not. Um, and, um, uh, you know, we give back hundreds of millions of dollars in free care each yeah. year because that's what our mission's about. And we, you know, we work very hard with other community organizations uh, to address those health disparities. I can give you several examples. Yeah, no, that would be good. So, I mean, so on the one hand, you know, free care, I can understand that. The, some of the things that you described before, um, you know, giving people free food, Rides. Mm-hmm. It all makes sense economically. It's also something you would expect, you know, governmental organization or you know other others to to do. So it's. I think it's kind of dramatic of what happens when you really get tasked with you know population health uh, yeah. overall. But do tell me about some of these. And you, you told me about certain things, but I'd love to hear you know some of the areas that you look to as real successes. Uh, you know, yeah. once you've done some examples, would be great. And 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 if you care to share anything that hasn't been as successful that you've tried. Sure, sure. Well, you know, like every organization, we're a work in progress. We've got lots of successes. Yeah. But we, we, we have we, we continue to have challenges, and I'm happy to talk about both um, because, you know, what are they? What, it's been said that if, if if you don't confront and acknowledge your you know your challenges, your problems, you're never going to solve them. You're never going to fix yeah. them. So we're, we're very open about what you know what we do well and what we need to do better. Uh, well, let me give you a couple of examples. Um, um, it, uh, you cradle Cincinnati. Uh, so, so fifth, uh, actually, even before I arrived in Cincinnati in, two, in 2013, um, you know, it, it was recognized Tri Health, um, uh, Cincinnati Children's, which was recognized as the you know right. the, the number one children's hospital in the country. We have we have deep relationships with uh, Cincinnati Children's, um, and so in 2013, we came together with Cincinnati Children's, other healthcare providers within Greater Cincinnati. Um, uh, uh, foundations and, and funders uh, to create an organization called Cradle Cincinnati. And we came together because we had an alarmingly high uh, rate of infant and maternal mortality, particularly in African in the African American community. And we created an organization called Cradle Cincinnati and funded it, and it continues to operate. And through um, you know programs ranging from safe sleep, you know, uh, post delivery to, you know, prenatal, uh, improve prenatal care, uh, to better nutrition, uh, and a number of other things we were able to drive down, um, avoidable, preventable, uh, maternal and fetal deaths, uh, and, and are continuing to do that. No longer leading the, the country yeah. as the worst, uh, you know, a city, <coughs> or at least close to being the worst, uh, in the nation, um, made encouraging progress there. I will tell you that as well. Uh, we have, through other partnerships, we've established eight or nine free food uh, banks um, and in our patients, and we, we place these in, in areas of our community in, and in our facilities that, that care for, um, you know, a, a disproportionately large, um, you know, a, a percentage of patients that are at risk for these uh, uh, social determinants of health, food insecurity. Um, we as well, uh, we, we built, um, spent about $35 million building a, a major ambulatory campus in an area that I, 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 I was quoted as uh, referring to as a, as a medical desert uh, yeah. because there, were, there weren't, it, and it's, you know, on our, on the West side and, uh, and it is, um, it's bustling. Uh, it's, it's been in operation for about a, a year and it's grown rapidly and, and we've we've closed that that gap in in access to care. Um, we've um, you know we we established probably 15 years ago um, what is now the largest uh, free healthcare center in Ohio. It's on the west side in a socioeconomic uh, economically challenged neighborhood. That same neighborhood that I referenced has a life expectancy of uh, right. 60 years, um, and um, and a number of other things. What I will tell you is you know where where can we you know, where can we uh, perform better? Um, we we are standing up, um, and actually the only adult healthcare system in this region. Uh, we're standing up a center for health equity. Actually, it's it's being stood up as we speak. We'll be investing uh, roughly $4 million a year in 
uh, in resources that are aimed at doing three things. Uh, one is to um, continue to um, you know, strengthen our culture, uh, make this a, 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 an organization that uh, fosters trust and a sense of belonging on the part of our diverse community. So a, a very robust uh, DEIB uh, focus uh, to, to make this, you know, to, to continue to be, to be the culture that, uh, that uh, in the organization that our community trusts, because we know that trust translates into compliance uh, right. and confidence and a willingness to come and receive care and, and to accept the advice of physicians. Um, the second is internal performance improvement uh, ar around uh, our own disparities in care. And we do have disparities in care. We, five years ago, began uh, um, collecting what we call uh, real data, race, ethnicity, and language data mm -hmm. for every patient. So today, about 99% of our patients, 98, 99% of our patients, we have that demographic information. So we can, um, um, we, we can uh, um, 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 d disaggregate information around race and around eth ethnicity performance data. And uh, we know where there's opportunities to improve uh, our clinical performance around those demographic uh, subsets. And then the, the, the third area of focus of our uh, Center for Health Equity is building community coalitions like we did with Cradle Cincinnati uh, uh, to, you know, to, 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 to address, you know, the life expectancy gap, for example, that I touched on a moment ago. And we're forging partnerships with other like minded community organizations to do just that. We've got a lot of work to do in Cincinnati. No, it, sound, it sounds great. Well, Mark, my last question for you is if you wouldn't mind providing advice to other health systems that maybe didn't start so steeped in the population health uh, side of things, but you know, how might other health systems uh, move toward a population health model? Um, you, you know, what, for us, uh, we recognize that uh, that moving into population health was not something that you could dabble with. Uh, that you needed to make a decision to to, to really be all in and um, and. And that decision was made on the part of, you know, our board and our leadership team, our physician community uh, in 2015, 2016. Um, and, uh, you know, I think many, you know, many organizations, healthcare organizations, you know, colleagues of mine, friends of mine um, are just dabbling with population yeah. health. And, and uh, it, it, um, what we've learned is that you have to be all in. Uh, and, and all in means uh, that you really have to fundamentally change the way in which you think about how you're delivering care and how you're financing care uh, and, and get out of that place. You know, to, the, you've heard the metaphor, no doubt, of having yeah. a foot in both canoes. Right. Uh, and um, I, I would tell you that we no longer have a foot in both canoes. We're all in the population. Now, but it's, it, uh, it's, it's taken us nearly a decade. Uh, yeah. The second thing that I would uh, suggest is find an execution partner, uh, because this is really hard work, uh, and it will require a, um, a fundamental change in care models, in your culture, uh, in financing systems. Um, the third thing that I would that, that we've learned and that, that I think has en enabled us to, to be successful in this transformational journey is don't don't go too fast. Uh, right. Don't take on risk before your organization has built the infrastructure and and demonstrated the competency to manage risk. So <clears throat> we we were um, five years into our journey before uh, we began to take downside risk. We were you know, the focus of our of our um, um, uh, you know uh, the the the, the um, uh, the changes in in, in our uh, payment uh, systems were really around uh, upside shared savings, around ambulatory pay for, per, or excuse me, uh, um, uh, pay for performance uh, in the ambulatory setting, uh, as well as delegated services like care management. Um, and uh, before we took any downside risk, and we now have we, we now have risk for about two hundred thousand of our three hundred thousand value based payments, and have never. Um, had to write a check um, because we built the competencies uh, and assessed our readiness to take risk before we negotiated risk-based contracts. And um, 
And uh, what we've learned is that it's important that you synchronize the transformation around care, care model change along with financing model change. Because if you move too aggressively to change your care models and you move more care out of your systems before you're getting rewarded for it with value-based payment arrangements, uh, you'll put the organization at financial distress. If you move too aggressively with your uh, evolution or transformation of, of financing systems, uh, and take too much risk before you can manage it, you'll put the organization at financial risk. So you really have to perfectly time um, the, the change on both the financing and the care model redesign sides. Good. Well, easier said than done. And i um, happy to uh, get that extra word of wisdom uh, in there. Well, that's it for the latest episode of the Cure Talk Executive Feature Series. My guest today is Mark Clement, President and CEO of TriHealth. If you enjoyed this, sh this show, which I'm sure you did, please leave a rating and subscribe on your favorite service. And Mark, thanks so much for being my guest today on Care Talk. Dave, it was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. My pleasure.